but at least then uh, it's being recorded anyway, isn't it? So. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Dominique. Thank you so much for the invitation um, today to speak to you again after four years. Uh, last time I was here was 2019, uh, short before the pandemic. And so it's uh, high time that I come back uh, to give you a, an update on what's going on at Gobekli Tepe. Um, so I've, I've just got loads of stuff to show you, I suppose, and it's going to take a while, but uh, I'll try and keep within the time limit. Um, if you need to go or you want to stop, just shout at me. Um, so the title of today's uh, lecture is Who Built Gobekli Tepe? And of course, I forgot this and why, I think that's more importantly. Um, I'm not going to say a great deal about this. I mean, it's ongoing debate, of course, as to who built or what were the social structures or the hierarchies at this time, um, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago. Uh, very little is known and lots is discussed. Uh, most importantly, I'm going to give you a summary of, of the recent field work. Uh, so, as Dominique said, from uh, 2021 to 2023, 2020 weren't in the field because of the pandemic. That was the first year ever, I think, that no one was there since 1995 when excavation started. So, um, what I'm going to do first is give you a brief, actually, I'll grab this. So, this is more or less what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the site. I don't know if there are any sort of non-archaeologists archaeologists here, but for that reason, uh, a brief sort of introduction to the context, sort of chronological and cultural. Um, then we get on to the recent results from free field work uh, in the past three years, um, mainly looking at domestic contexts, which have been a major part of what we've been looking at, but also in the past uh, three years, also running excavations in special building D, and a newly excavated burial, uh, which came out, uh, which was known previously, but was excavated um, also a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'll also show you the other, I've only got two burials, but it's better than none. Um, but I'll show you both of those uh, as well. And then we get on to the sort of theoretical bit about who built Gebekli Tepe. And I want to go briefly again um, onto a subject that I've mentioned in a paper or so earlier on uh, a couple of years back as a hunter-gatherer crisis because that ties in quite well with who this hierarchy uh, could have been. Anyway, let's proceed. Um, is, is this the idea? Is, is that lies? It does. It does. Okay. No, I don't mind me. It's probably more of a problem for you because otherwise perhaps some of the images won't be as clear. Okay, this is then the general sort of introduction to the slide I always show before I speak uh, about Quebec. It's just sort of giving you a, a rough sort of time frame and cultural context of the site. So Quebec uh, broadly speaking, dates from the, the sort of mid 10th millennium to around 8,000 or perhaps a bit younger uh, BC. So we're in a period called the pre-pottery Neolithic. As you may know, uh, the sort of neolithization process is a process which took a long period of time. When we say neolithization, we mean sort of becoming settled and, and farming, um, uh, you know, getting developing potteries, different packages that come uh, as part of this neolithic development. And that sort of sprawls over a long time period um, from the late Paleolithic um, right through you know, first pottery around 7,000 BC in southeastern Turkey um, in, in uh, upper Mesopotamia. And we are then placed, uh, or the site of Gobekli Tepe lies then in this uh, PPNA, early to middle PPNB timeframe. Um, so when you hear me speaking about PPNA, uh, I'm talking about around 9, 6, 8, 7, 000, 8, 700 BC, early PPNB, sort of the mid uh, ninth millennium. Then we have the middle PPNB coming in and the late PPNB. And after that, of course, the pottery Neolithic, so the pre pottery Neolithic, followed by the pottery Neolithic. And here, uh, just a map to show you the, the fertile crescent. I think everyone knows about that. Um, so that's just a bit of basic uh, sort of background, um, cultural and uh, chronological. Research history is, of course, quite important for us uh, as Germans. Uh, the Germans are very keen on their research history. That's why I, I like to show this uh, slide. Um, so from, uh, I think, where Gobekli Tepe is concerned, we start really off in the 1960s. That's when the site was first discovered in the frame of survey work undertaken in the frame of the prehistoric research in the Southeastern Anatolian project, which was coordinated by Halak Chambel from the University of Istanbul and Robert Braidwood from the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. 
As I say, many sites were discovered during this uh, time, including Chayanu and Gobekli Tepe. But at the time, they actually decided to start excavations uh, at Chayanu in 1964 and disregarded Gobekli uh, for various reasons. Uh, the next big sort of chapter or milestone, you might say, is the, 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 the dam projects, particularly the Lower Euphrates project in the 1970s, when uh, various sites were excavated uh, before you know, the, the dam, the, the, the reservoirs were flooded. Um, in the frame of, of, of this project down here in the Lower Euphrates, uh, Howard Hoffman uh, discovered, or not he, he didn't personally discover it, but he was in charge of excavations the site was discovered during his excavations at, I think it was uh, Lillahuyuk, uh, quite nearby, was then Nevali Choni. Um, that was discovered whilst he was working there. So through his his team actually discovered the site. And that led to the excavations at Nevali Choni um, from 1983 to 1991, 92. And this is the first T-pillar site ever excavated in the Shaman of the region, where of course these sites are characteristic. Moving on in the 1990s, of course, things didn't stop. Um, there were numerous archaeological surveys carried out in this part of the country, leading to the discovery of further T-pillar sites, uh, desert kites, so these hunting traps, and flint sources. Uh, very important work there done by our colleague Bahatin Celik, um, who did a lot of this work. He also did some excavation at one of those sites uh, at Harbid Suan Tepe, another T-pillar site not far from Kalahan Tepe. Um, in 1995, you can see excavation started at Gebeti Tepe um, under the direction of the Shannon Orphan Museum with Harald Hauptmann. From 2007 to 14, Klaus Schmidt then took over the excavation uh, directorship. Um, and in 2010, he was able to start this previously mentioned DFG long term funding project, the Early Holocene Societies of Upper Mesopotamia and their subsistence, which is just coming to a close in these months. So I think August uh, is our last uh, uh, deadline and then the project will finish. Um, another important milestone, 2011, uh, the site was included on the tentative list of the UNESCO World Heritage, uh, uh, tentative UNESCO World Heritage list. Um, and in 2016-17, in preparation for the proper inscription or the, the application at least, uh, we had the construction of these uh, big shelters or these uh, canopies, two of which, uh, two were built, uh, where we had to then uh, also, of course, take care that none of the archaeology was damaged. A special wooden shelter was constructed over the main excavation area, which acted as a sort of uh, um, a workspace and to construct uh, this sort of uh, a new canopy, the, the, the big white Pringle thing that you see there today where the public can go in. Um, and that was then successful. Uh, the application in 2018, the site became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I forgot to mention here on the right hand side, you can see Orthoman. Um, this is then what was the earliest, sort of the, 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 at that point, or the first uh, life size human uh, statue uh, known, and that was found in the 1990s in uh, Quebec, in, in Orpha, in downtown Orpha, uh, during building work. Um, so that was the result of this sort of the wood surveys. Anyway, we continue. Um, Exactly, around 2014-15, so when we were preparing for the construction of these canopies, um, we were doing deep soundings through the archaeology down to the natural bedrock of the site. Um, this was necessary, of course, because they couldn't actually anchor these new shelters. Um, they couldn't drill through the archaeology, so they had to uh, excavate deep sondages first so they could drill into the ground and anchor these or into the rock and anchor these two new shelters. And it was during these uh, deep soundings that we had our first real sort of insights into the earliest layers of the site. And here you can see um, this is a, uh, a trench um, a sondage, which is located in the northwestern part here under this shelter here. Um, and when we got to the bottom of this, we did find really different structures to those that were known from the main excavation area. And through comparison, um, to the size, etc., we can actually say with quite uh, with certainty that we're dealing with domestic structures here, non-monumental non but multi-phase domestic structures. Um, here, smaller agglomerative uh, buildings, uh, and here also activity zones with hearths, multiple hearths, um, and uh, dense uh, finds of, of lots of, of uh, bone tools the bead production, various things going on in these activity zones. So this was a, a good 
insight for us that even from the earliest phase of Gebeki Tepe, we know from comparative comparisons that these dates are PPN, these uh, structures are PPNA in date. Uh, and also above these structures, we also have radiocarbon dates that are of a PPNA age. So in actual fact, they could even go back a bit further, but we don't have any, any processed uh, radiocarbon ages from this, uh, these contexts at the moment. Um, Staying with the architecture just briefly, because we did actually a re-evaluation of earlier um, uh, documentation from Klaus Schmidt's excavations, um, and did some sort of continued excavation. Some of the buildings had already uh, excavated, or at least partially excavated. Um, you can see here building 16. And what we have here is very interestingly, probably a transitional building from the PPNA to the early PPNB, because actually when we excavated the floor here, which had left unexcavated at the time, um, we actually found a more round oval plaster floor where probably benches have been removed and the building actually restructured into a, into a rectangular building. So we have actually this transitional from the round oval sort of uh, domestic buildings to the more trapezoid rectangular buildings, which are characteristic of the early PPNB at Gebeki Tepe. We have that actually as um, a feature and that's this building up here. This is uh, space 16, just north on the slope up from building D. Then we have a lot of buildings here, um, all, were, all partially excavated by Klaus Schmidt. Um, and this building is building or space eight, which is just here. This is also excavated because there's now actually a, a support for the walkway at Quebec to Tepe. Um, and uh, we can see here is really uh, spectacular. We have actually this trapezoid shaped building. We have here a niche in the corner. We have actually uh, stone vessels and grinding stones in situ. We have actually what appears to be grinding stones that have fallen from, a, from the roof or from a, an upper story, because underneath there's actually sort of remains of what appears to be a, a plaster. Um, we have a plaster floor, we have also benches and sometimes a tea pillar. Um, and this type of building, as you can see, is found all the way around on the slopes around the main excavation area uh, where these special buildings are located. This leads us into a more schematic sort of view of, of this building type. There are other building types um, that diverge from this, but uh, usually we have a rectangular or trapezoid structure. We have a bench, sometimes a T-pillar, sometimes a niche, um, grinders in the roof flaps. Uh, the entrance of these buildings is probably through the roof. So we have so-called portal stones or fragments of portal stones very frequently in the fill of the buildings. Um, sometimes we have indications there was an upper story uh, so perhaps we're just looking at the cellars of these of these buildings. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is a very characteristic of what, of what we have. And um, this is actually what we've been finding in more recent excavations. I'll show you some more recent pictures of some of the domestic structures in just a moment. The other big news at the time was the, the realization that the, um, the special buildings were in fact long-lived structures and very long-lived structures, in fact. We had uh, radiocarbon dates or radiocarbon samples, organic samples taken, mostly charcoal, taken from the walls uh, of building D and actually from other special buildings as well. Um, and when they was, these were processed, they came back quite remarkably um, with a very large two clusters, as you can see here. One clearly a PPNA, although here's a bit of a plateau obviously in the calibration curve, um, and a clearly younger uh, set of um, radiocarbon dates uh, from the early PPNB. And when you compared the samples to their origin, we found that these younger PPN, early PPNB dates were coming from the younger phase of the building, whereby the older dates were coming from an older phase of, of the building. So it's showing us that uh, really, and it's really, uh, this is how it's done actually in, in many sites. We have a larger earlier phase, and they built another building within that, and another building within that, so that it was getting gradually smaller. And of course, this latest phase was dating to the early PPNB and the earlier phases to the PPNA, which does suggest that we are seeing buildings in use um, for decades, probably even centuries, um, which is a very important insight, because that also means that um, these special buildings are also, sorry, are also contemporaneous then with these uh, domestic buildings, the latest phases, obviously. And of course, we have then had to sort of, because Klaus Schmidt suggested a three-part um, chronology, uh, or at least levels for Gebeki Tepe, three being PPNA, 
uh, special buildings, level two being the early PPNB, which you thought were the rectangular structures, and level one being the uh, upper layer. But now things look a lot different. We've got lots of colors going on. This is work in progress, obviously. It's, it's just we're having to use a combination of radiocarbon dating and building archaeology because the stratigraphy at the site is very difficult. There's no real deep stratigraphy, although we have deep sondages. We have a lot of horizontal stratigraphy, a lot of things going on um, in, the, in the surface and not actually in the vertical. So that's, I say, work in progress and will continue. Then, of course, there was a thing about, you know, were these special buildings ritually buried? Um, did we have groups coming to the site and ritually burying them? Um, and, of course, that's very difficult if you can imagine that these buildings were then actually surrounded by settlement. So how are you going to get in with all your wheelbarrows, what sexual weapons? Yeah. With your baskets, yeah. Sorry, slip of the uh... <laughs> you can't. Um, or you could, but it'd be a lot more hard work than, than uh, yeah, with a wheelbarrow. Um, so we've been looking at stratigraphy again, we looked at stratigraphy again, and we found increasing uh, evidence for uh for land uh, slope slide. Um, so you can see here, I mean, if you've been to the site, you know that these special buildings are sort of constructed in the lower parts of the mound, and the slopes going up, this is where you have the, 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 the domestic or the rectangular structures. And what we can see here probably is the superstructures of these buildings on the slope. I said perhaps we just have the cellars remaining. Um, the superstructures slipping down the mound, perhaps due to, I don't know, rainfall or earthquake, even we know that the earthquakes are particularly, or you know, they do occur down there, uh, especially since last February. Um, but perhaps a combination of both of these, but they were indeed having problems with slope pressure anyway at the site, because they were actually building terrace walls, um, to probably to actually make sure the slope was holding. Um, so they were trying their best, but eventually uh, this scenario uh, occurred. And as I say, we're now finding more and more evidence uh, that this was the case. Of course, I don't want to say ritual burial, we have, you know, that it didn't happen. Uh, that would be dangerous um, because there are sites <laughs> where there is perhaps ritual burial. Um, but in the case of Gebeke Tepe, I think we have to look for, from you know, case to case, from building to building, um, and take every case separately and look at the evidence. But as far as we can see at the moment, especially for building D, we are certainly looking with slope erosion and slope slide, of which probably led or led to the um, inundation and the filling of the buildings. At the same time, within the fill that we've been excavating at the site, we have found uh, trample layers. So it could be that we have more than one slope event, and that during these events, they were actually walking around on the surface and using those surfaces um, uh, during these interim periods. Anyway, we digress. Um, you've probably all heard of the Tashpepe the project. Of course, now Gebeki Tepe, and since 2021, uh, Gebeki Tepe has been or is part or is a main part of the uh, overarching Tashpepe the project. Uh, initiated in, as I say, 2021 by the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism. So it builds on results really from Nevali Choli, um, from Göbekli Tepe, and of course Karahan Tepe since 2019. Um, it also has seen continued field work at Gürtü Tepe. This is a late a PPN site, uh, now very much built over in Urfa, uh, that was originally excavated um, or partially excavated uh, by Klaus Schmidt, was in the, in the early years of Göbekli Tepe. Um, we also have uh, continued excavations at Harvitsuan. I mentioned that uh, our colleague uh, Barton Chelik did some excavations there as well. And we have new sites. Um, you probably also heard of Cyborg uh, with this wonderful um, relief there in a the special building. Uh, Sefer Tepe as well. Here on the eastern side is Cyborg on the west of the Haram Plain. Um, and Chakna, Chakna Tepe, which is a very interesting site. It's one of the earliest sites. I think it could be a predecessor to what we're seeing at Gebeki Tepe. We don't have any tipulas there yet, but we do have communal structures. Um, so that's all very interesting and will help us, obviously, understand what we found at Gebeki Tepe much better. So I'm, I'm very happy that we have more comparative material now um, to actually sort of look at Gebeki Tepe and sort of uh, see if we're on the right track or not and perhaps see some uh, new things as well. Anyway. Dating, yeah, I mean, this is exciting as well, because, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, there's always this discussion in the Turkish press, you know, oldest, biggest, superlative, and uh, uh, it, it was always discussed, yeah, 
Karen mm -hmm. Tepe is older. Karen Tepe is older. Um, I don't know. It could be. It might not be. Um, these are actually newly uh, available yes. radiocarbon dates from uh, Karen Tepe uh, and Sidewatch. The dates from Gobekli, Yeni Mahalli, that's in the center of Wuppa, and Nibali Choi were already known. Uh, the date first dates from Karahan, okay, we've got a date here in the NEPPMB that fits. We've got a couple of dates here in the, in the um, Epipaleolithic, quite surprisingly. I don't know the context, so uh, we need to look at this. Um, but uh, for Sidewatch, we also have very clear early PPNB dates, which I'm, I'm very happy about because it fits, fits in with my sort of understanding of what's going on in this region at that time. Um, and there's also from uh, here, Sefetep, we have three luminescent states, also averaging 8,500 BC, so also falling into the early PPMB uh, sort of box, as it were. So it all looks very good. So in all the Tashtepler site, or the Tashtepler project rather, is covering a period from the Younger Dryas uh, right through into the late PPM into the early Holocene. And this for a big region. And of course, it also focused on the period which saw the first appearance of settled communities, so demographic change, the appearance of domesticated species, monumental architecture, uh, social hierarchization, territoriality, conflict scenarios, etc. Uh, and of course, also uh, as suggested by the shared imagery of what Klaus Schmidt referred to as a common cultic community. Uh, actually, this one here, I, I included this here because this guy was always hidden by Klaus Schmidt. He always had a bit of wood against this, this pillar because he always said, if I show the people that, they will say it's aliens. So um, <laughs> now it's, 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 it is actually visible. Um, but the guy has great, yeah, he's, he's great. I, I like him. He's in building F, by the way. Okay, field work, 2021, 2023. We're quite busy, obviously, um, after the pandemic. We went back in 2021, we couldn't stay as long as we wanted to because we did have uh, problems with COVID in camp and in the village, and uh, we had to sort of uh, sort of finish early. But we did uh, remove the so-called Soigen block. I'll show you what that is in a second from building D. We did a, a, a small sondage in building H. Um, this is in the northwestern part of the site where we found the floor of the building and above the floor, uh, we had the remains of a uh, cat's roof. But we'll come to Claps Roots again in a minute. And we had new excavations, as, as I said, in the domestic area. In 2022, um, we continued work in building D with the excavation of a pit found in the floor. We had also the continuation of these uh, excavations in the domestic areas on the northern slope of the main excavation area. And last year, we focused a lot on building D, but of course, we did have a, a bit of uh, work to do uh, to support the museum after the flooding and the earthquake, which we were participating in. So that was uh, sort of split up efforts there. Anyway, let's progress. Here is then, uh, this is the main excavation area under the big white pringle. Um, and here is the other sort of special buildings, so called temples, uh, A, B, C, and D with these domestic structures. And here you can see terrace walls coming in. Uh, we were looking at this area. I say all of these rooms were partially excavated when uh, before Klausman died. It's his his work. And uh, first of all, uh, we actually cleaned up these four structures here uh, on top of or towards the top of the slope and revealed these wonderful plaster floors with these. Uh, uh, you see here, oh, yeah, uh, stone big large limestone vessels, grinders. Uh, plaster floor, very uh, no T pillars in sight, uh, which I'm always happy about because you know T pillars on everything. Um, and then in the following year, we went down the slope in front of these buildings because the problem was uh, there was a problem. We were still, we were still having problems with slope pressure and erosion, and this is what the the trench sides looked like right next to the visitor walkway. So we said, okay, I've got to do something about this, which we did. So we tidied this up and cleaned it. And by the end of 2021, we ended up with fantastic results with these new uh, rooms. I mean, uh, one of them here, room 61, I'll show you more in more detail in a second, with a preservation of over two meters in, uh, towards the mound. The, towards the south, obviously, um, it was less well preserved because, of course, the slope erosion, et cetera, was happening even uh, in the Neolithic. Um, so that's what we had. That was then documented uh, in the following year, 2022, by Benny Bass. 
Um, and here you can see this is one of the four rooms that I showed you on the, towards the top of the slope. And in front of that down slope downwards, as it were, we have these additions, additional rooms. There's a room here, or a space here, and two spaces here. Initially, we thought this was perhaps a, a, a round building that had been converted to a rectangular one. It turned out that the walls were actually additional and later. Um, interesting here is this area where we have preserved plaster and a fragment of a portal stone. It appears to be or looks like the flipped um, roof or up of story uh, lying here. So, um, or this actually here as well. This is in room 61 that I just mentioned. So we have this characteristic bench uh, here. This is unexcavated um, because we're worried the wall is going to collapse. Um, but I say it's two meters, over two meters height. We've got this uh, bench here. We have uh, in situ grinding stones actually in the plaster floor. We have this very big stone, uh, limestone vessel. Uh, this grinder actually came from the fill and probably actually collapsed from the upper up a story or from the roof of the building. What you just saw here in the corner is that this thing here, a possible hearth or oven in the building. Um, it's actually shaped in the plaster in this corner. Um, unfortunately, there was no sign of ash or charcoal or anything like that, but um, we're still wondering actually about the function of such a uh, feature. So our sort of wood decision, oven or hearth or something of the like, but uh, we're willing to, to take on, you know, if you have any, any suggestions, happy to hear them. So this is then these two buildings, or this is the, the room 61, with the stone vessel, and here this uh, feature that I just showed you, the bench, and here another bu a, a building next door, also class a floor, a bench. So they, it's, it's a very sort of a schematic uh, way of building. Um, but let's say in this area, we have no T pillars whatsoever. We have here is the, the so-called lion pillar building, now renamed the leopard pillar building because we know the word lions there. Um, so this is the, the old lion pillar building. Here's uh, room 16 that I just uh, uh, showed you. Um, so here we have uh, uh, sort of uh, tea pillars popping up, but here none. And here this sort of type of building, but with tea pillars. So they follow some sort of uh, scheme uh, but vary, yeah, and it seems to be also uh, linked to where they are on the mound. Ah, oh, this is quite exciting. This is um, this is a bulk that we it, we said, oh, it's quite ugly. We should actually remove it, yeah. So we removed the bulk, and as you can see, this bulk is that's more or less the old surface. Um, it's the north bulk of this trench. Um, down here we have uh, this is the fill of a of the neighboring early PPMD building. And down here we have building G, which is another special building, similar to the one from the Valley Choli. Um, so a later sort of early PPMD uh, building. Um, and we removed this and lo and behold, we found something else. Now this has to be one of the latest uh, structures uh, at Gebek Tepe. Uh, we have two or three of them um, on the site. Uh, also known from earlier excavations, they were recorded, but they never got published. Um, they're you know, a couple of meters in diameter, and they always have these upright limestone slabs and plaster floor. Now, whether we don't know how old they are, we know they're post early PPMB. They must be because of the stratigraphy. Um, but we have no pottery, we have no uh, organic residue that we can date. So at the moment, uh, we just know them as we, we think they're from sort of late PPM. Um, but they could be much later. Um, but this would then be the latest evidence of occupation, or at least uh, architecture at the Gebekli Tepe. Okay, let's get to building D. We want to see the pig. Um, <laughs> so uh, we did three years of work. I mentioned uh, previously that we had 2021, uh, the excavation of the so-called soil block. I'll show you that in a second. 2022, we excavated this pit that came out after the removal of the Zeugen block. And then 2023, we well, last year, we excavated in four different areas. So 2021, this is the Zeugen block, um, which is German for the actually, block of, of uh, the testimony, testimony block. Um, it was thought that, well, Klaus Schmidt wanted to show the visitors or people that came what the feel of the buildings looked like. So uh, this was a testimony, testimony to the fill. 
which you can see com is composed of, of fist-sized rubble, limestone rubble, uh, bits of animal bone, lots of animal bone, lots of flint, grinders, you name it, it's in it. Um, and this then we removed in 2021, uh, and this pit here appeared, which you can see here, we've got an autograph, uh, 3D modeling, um, uh, you can see it here. So here's the, the pedestal of the left-hand central pillar. This is the wooden modern support. Here's this larger pit that also hasn't been excavated yet, um, but it's been known for years since the, the, the building was excavated back in the early 2000s, and uh, this smaller pit. Uh, so we thought, okay, um, so in 2022, uh, we had Julia Greski with us, who was looking at the graves at the time, said, okay, if it's going to be something, because we're getting quite excited, is it a skull nest? Is it, you know, something really cool? Um, oh, no. um, we opened it, and it was empty. It was quite flat. So we have this sort of crevice here that goes down the middle way. It was filled with sort of sediment, but there were no finds. It was absolutely empty. So it, it appears that it's a natural sort of fault in the rock that I'm just trying to iron out. Um, but we, we can't find anything. Uh, we, the reason we were so excited is because up here, there was a bit of red ochre, yeah. Here, there was a slab and it was like fixed with like wedges on each side. And I don't know if you can see it, but here engraved in the floor is an H or I symbol right next to it. I mean, you know, obviously we're gonna think it's gonna be something uh, along the lines of a burial or something, but unfortunately, Perhaps it was the speaker's corner, perhaps it was somewhere where, the, where someone stood and it was, had some sort of significance, obviously, in the building. Um, but, uh, and it was marked as such with this H or I symbol, which we get a lot on, on the pillars, um, but also, say, with the red colouring uh, around the edge of the pit that was still preserved. Okay, then when uh, 2023, I said we did four areas. This is the first area here in the northwestern part. We removed a little bit of sediment that was still left uh, against the wall of the, or the inner bench of the building. And we found a wonderfully preserved plaster on, on the wall. So it's actually a continuation of the plaster that's preserved in this area here as well. Um, nice. Uh, enjoyed that. Um, there, but much better was, was this area over here, which we went down very carefully. Um, and then this came out, and what we have here, uh, it appears to be the negatives of the wooden roof, um, which are preserved in the fill of the building. And this got really interesting, and we had, first of all, uh, this one going um, west-east, and then we had one going north-south, crossing it. I mean, that's not a fox. Um, it's, it's definitely, uh, we think it's definitely uh, the, the preserved negatives of a wood, or wooden beams, which collapsed there, but not very far off the, off the floor of the building. Um, so we're very happy with that, it was a great result. Moving on, uh, ah yes, the, the, the focal point. Um, you can see here the, the very center or the, the northern wall of the facade, inner facade of the building, uh, this unexcavated area. Went in, I wasn't the one thinking much about it. You know, we're going down in, in, in uh, 20 centimeter spits. Um, there was nothing curious about that uh, until this little sort of stone, this sort of smooth stone came out. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we had the wild boar, um, which you can see here. So it's in a very central position uh, between the two uh, central T pillars. It was obviously the focus of this building placed in front of one of the sort of, in, in most of the buildings we have this, uh, these sort of broadside on pillars missing the heads and they have this sort of round uh, perforation. Um, they're always, there's nothing in them, but obviously they were used as a niche to perhaps display something, put something in. Um, Klaus Schmidt always referred to these stones as the washing machines. So that each building has a washing machine. And um, you can see the level of excavation here, this sort of dark color, that's what the level we actually excavated down. Then we had the, the pillar, uh, the, the, the bench here, was, the, the floor was placed on a bench. I know this bit. Um, so it's a near life-sized uh, wild boar uh, statue of limestone. It's about one meter, I think it's 130. Like 60 high at uh, its highest point. Um, of course, you probably read the, the news articles, you know, we had preserved 
pigment. So the mouth was red with some black pigment, pigment on the body. And this was the first time we had this sort of real evidence. We always thought perhaps from that tea pillow was a bit of color, um, I'm colorblind anyway, so I have a problem with that. But the, the colleagues were saying, ah, oh, some color there. But this was the first time in a freshly excavated object that we had this preserved pigment that I could actually see. So uh, um, the, the red was more or less focused or restricted to the, to the mouth region, which is given so much detail anyway with the, with the tongue coming out and nostrils. Um, you put the little ripples here on the snout. Um, so uh, this is a, a very um, impressive piece of work. And this is a bench that it was put upon. This bench appears to be a reused tea pillar because they were reusing the tea pillars quite frequently. Uh, instead of quarrying a new tea pillar, it made more sense to grab one that was used earlier from an older building phase and, and just use that. Um, but this one is marked with the characteristic H symbol that we have very frequently in building H, also on the belts of the, of the central pillar beams. Um, a couple of snakes or three snakes, and around the corner here we have two or three faces or masks. Um, so it definitely appears to be a, a reused uh, pillar. The other thing that was very interesting, speaking about this slope slide uh, narrative or scenario that we're proposing, is what was going on to the east of the pig of the wild wall. Sorry, this area you can see here, this central, this pillar here in the wall has been pushed in. Yeah, by the, the force of the, of the slope. And we have all of this rubble coming in here. The wall has been destroyed. So it seems actually that the, the, the slope pushed in and destroyed this part of the wall uh, next to the pig. So we're very lucky that this, this was actually preserved and survived. Uh, this was very exciting. In this uh, rubble here, just less than a meter from the wild boar, we had the very large fragment of a wild boar jaw. Now the question is, did this come down the slope or was it perhaps pushed off of the bench? I like to think it's pushed off the bench. <laughs> if, it had, if, it had, if it was pushed off the bench, then we could be looking really at sort of meat offerings related to, I mean, a wild, we don't get that many wild boar bones like that. And a fragment of jaw, so close. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm tending to think that we were seeing some sort of offerings. I don't like to word, use the word sacrifice, but you know, it's, I just said it. <laughs> um, and then to the east of uh, this platform or the, 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 the bench and the ball, we have this uh, other area here. Uh, actually in the wall, there's a, a, a teepan that's been reused, but horizontally in the wall. And you can see here where we expose it away, we expose it away and we get another niche. So this is now the total front, uh, the northern front of uh, uh, looking inwards towards the north of building D. This is the famous pillar 43 with the head of the sky um, and uh, the vulture and the scorpion. This is this one here. This is then the bench with the, with the pig and then this horizontal uh, uh, T pillar in the wall with this other niche. So um, now we can say that the northern front or the northern you look more focus at the building is now entirely excavated. Here's a preserved plaster floor, by the way, a plaster on the wall, by the way. So, um, yeah, we're very happy with that. Um, we just have to think about how we're going to secure the, the, the section here. Um, you can see here the, the, the rubble coming down. Okay. Burials. Okay, we had one burial already uh, that was discovered in 2017. I think I mentioned it in my last talk. Um, it was actually found. Right on the edge of the photo here, because this is the new uh, shelter, the new, say, new 2018 17 canopy. We had a, a water drainage pipe coming from this canopy, a modern one, obviously, and we had to excavate a trench to sort of bury it. Um, and lo and behold, we see a, a PPMB building with a plaster floor um, with a kidney shaped pit. Um, and we excavated and we found uh, this, this uh, burial, disturbed, obviously, in, in antiquity, sorry, in, in, the, in the Neolithic. Um, a multiple burial with these three relatively complete individuals. Uh, the skeletal elements were not in situ, so we have three skulls sort of placed up here in the, in the southeast, and then the other bones pushed to the side in the middle part of the, of the pit. Um, we have the first individual is a female, um, 35 plus years old, antimortem anti tooth loss, pronounced dental wear, osteoporosis, poor dear, um, in areas of muscle attachment, a well healed, this is quite interesting, well healed fracture depression fracture in the middle third of the left parietal bone, possibly trauma-related. 
Um, so, but she healed, and but it could be identification of interpersonal violence at Quebec and Um The second individual is male, 20 to 30 years old. Uh, this age is suggested by dental wear and the closure of the cranial structures. And we have a female, 11 to 14, in this pit. There were no grave goods. There were no, apart from a couple of uh, flints. So we're looking at flint knives, quite long flint blades. Where I'm just wondering whether they were being used to actually sort of, you know, dissect or whatever. But uh, they didn't appear to be like grave goods uh, in the in the sort of uh, common sense of the word. The second burial was actually already found by discovered by Klaus Schmidt in 2012. But he kind of covered it back up because he didn't have time to excavate it, and they never got excavated. These are photos from 2012. The burial is located to the west of Building A in a small rectangular sort of structure. Um, um, the individual is hocker, so on the side, um, in a crouched position, so hocker, facing east, um, and it was found on a layout of fist-sized stones, but there was no distinct burial pit, it wasn't visible, but I think that probably, it probably was a subterranean or subfloor burial. Uh, when we got back in 2022, we did some author photos with Benny again, um, we found the petrous bone, um, and a bit of the skull. Um, what we, now? we are dealing with a to be 20, sorry, 20 to 30 year old male, female, sorry, um, as indicated by the gray style and small post cranial bones. And we don't have any more information than that, but we rescued this skeleton then uh, in 2022. Okay, now I'm going to come to the bit about the social elites. Um, I included this just to get you here because of the clickbait. Um, <laughs> as I was saying earlier. So discussions around the existence of social elites has been a long discussion. It's been you know, around for a very long time. As uh, we can see here, Diane, Kirk, Diane Kirkbride back in the 1960s when she was working in Jordan said that for Ava there was evidence of emerging village life with a hint of the presence of a privileged and not so privileged class. This was taken up by Mehmet Erstawan for uh, Chayonu um, when he said similar things. Uh, he noted the rigid order of the settlement, the intentional burial of houses, uh -huh. uh, the construction of plaster floors, and the organization of extensive labor. He considered the societal system the forerunner of the temporal control economy that comes up later um, in the Syro Mesopotamian cultures. Oh, it gets, it gets better. <laughs> um, ben Hauptmann, uh, obviously, after excavations in the Valley Chori and Quebec Tepe, says, according to him, different areas of these sites were dedicated to tool production, sculpture, and sanctuaries. And for Hauptmann, this was an indic indicative of steps developmental to a central organization in which the trade or barter of the elite class was restricted to sites with cult facilities. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, Mehmet Ostwan has gone a bit further and now actually sees the earliest temporal controlled economies coming up already in the pre pottery Neolithic, i.e., in the PPNA and PPNB. Um, now, saying that, I prefer, oh, we have to see what Klaus Schmidt said. He also spoke in 2000 of uh, shamans at the edge, the edge to cross the border from the animistic shaman to the established priest. Um, and of powerful rulers and a world of a classified society. Even though we have obviously meanwhile excavate uh, uh, burials and, and perhaps indications of uh, prestige items or buildings coming in the archaeological record from some sites, I think it still remains tentative the archaeological evidence for social hierarchization and for an elite class um, in the pre pottery Neolithic at the time of Quebec. I prefer instead to go back to Jacques Corbin um, and his Naissance de Divinité, uh, Naissance d'Agriculture, where he says the most primitive societies always find in their midst some inspired individuals whose function simply results from a spontaneous recognition among their fellows of a natural superiority that applies in certain defined circumstances. In the same way, a war leader in certain Paleo Indian tribes only remain chief as long as the war continued. And uh, I won't read it all, but I, I, I like to take this as uh, perhaps now as a, for me, a quest or, or an attempt, an experiment to see if I can identify some inspired individuals in the pre-Pothry Neolithic record. And I think we can. 
Um, I think there is sufficient evidence to propose the existence of three distinct roles. Those of the storyteller, the hunter, and the ritual adept. I don't like the word shaman because it has connotations more to Siberia. I speak of ritual adepts or ritual professionals, but I think the story, it could be one and the same person. But uh, these three functions, I think, were crucial to PPNA, a PPN life in uh, at the time of Gebeki Tepe. So the storyteller, of course, important for a storyteller are the narratives. And narratives, of course, pass on not knowledge, cultural and social values and collective memory. And they're crucial in keeping cultures alive. At Gebeki Tepe, the petrified narratives, we're talking about the teeplers with all of these wonderful animals on, obviously, they're not sort of willy nilly, just place, oh, I saw a snake today, there's a snake. But they actually tell stories, they are narratives. Um, and they cannot exist independently from storytellers. These narratives were formerly oral traditions that were then told by these uh, narrators, by the storytellers. Um, and unique narratives are found in each of the special buildings, and these could belong obviously to particular groups. Um, earlier studies have shown that the themes of the narratives are various. I mean, we have the death card, as suggested by Carl Schmidt and colleagues. We have the adherence of the prehistoric communities to photonic systems, uh, harnessing the vital forces and power of non-human animal actors, non-human, uh, human non-human relations, and predator-victim dichotomies. I mean, there are various things you can suggest. I mean, if you have the imagination, you can keep going and going and going. But there is a lot of, uh, of stuff there that you can use for narratives. So I think the storytellers did play a special role. And from, interestingly enough, if we look to the ethnographic evidence, skilled storytellers are in a position to manipulate their audiences, not only for community well-being, but also for their own personal gain. This can lead to considerable social benefits for these individuals as expressed in the status of storytellers as preferred social partners and their greater reproductive success. So if this scenario holds true for the prehistoric past, then it could be argued that the Gebeki Tepe storytellers could have belonged to a, an elite, as it were, the, un, or the invisible elite. <laughs> Coming to the hunter, uh, the hunters uh, obviously are, are ubiquitous. Um, we have these wonderful um, uh, narratives where we have human uh, narratives, uh, human uh, actors, this is the, the site of Cyborg, which I mentioned earlier, with this wonderful frieze um, in a special building. It probably is made up of two scenes. Here is the first scene where we have an auroch, an uh, auroch, and a guy here that seems to be uh, at least, uh, I don't know, tormenting or teasing, the, baiting the animal. Um, and here, I think we have a, a second scene, uh, and this is seen by other, by other um, colleagues as well, um, with an individual uh, here holding his penis. Uh, and flanked by two leopards. Um, now, what I think we're seeing here is perhaps a sort of um, uh, read the passage, like a, you know, uh, that you have as a hunter when you came of age. Um, here he is doing his deed, his brave deed, and here he is after completing his deed, um, celebrating. Um, <laughs> what I what I find find interesting is that there's a lot of discussion about what he's actually holding in his hand. Now, um, people said it's a sling. Uh, it could be um, a rattle. Um, and I hate to show you this, but uh, actually, I think it could be the the testicles of and the, the the penis of the bull itself. Um, and they, I found this on the internet. <laughs> um, but it does look remarkably similar, but this would be something that I think we could consider. I don't know what I can't see. I've been there many times to Cyborgs, but I cannot make out whether he actually has, um, it's, whether it's still intact or not. But if he hasn't got it intact, then perhaps this is what he's holding here. And this is him after yeah, he's, he's done his passage. Um, okay. Um, I don't want to go the wrong way. Okay, let's come to the ritual adept. So discussions in recent years have focused increasingly on evidence of so-called shamans um, in the remains from the early Olympic sites in Southwest Asia. And meanwhile, there's broad consensus that these shamans existed um, and it was linked to ancestor veneration, of which we have ample evidence at Quebec, you perhaps know the, the thing about the, the, the skulls and the, the uh, perhaps they were displayed, a skull cult published a few years back. And so these actually sort of, you know, we require the ritual adepts the ritual uh, guys to the specialists to uh, conduct uh, these uh, ceremonies. And of course, they would have been 
uh, also guys with, with with some sort of influence or, or ladies, uh, obviously we can't actually. Uh, the thing with gender, I mean, uh, when I'm talking about rich adepts and, and, and uh, uh, hunters and uh, storytellers, I'm not assigning a gender to any of them. I think, you know, that can be, um, the thing is we just, it's all indirect evidence anyway that I'm looking at. So, but it's interesting, the burials that we have are actually nearly all female so far. Um, and it does appear they their bodies were manipulated as well, and that they were the focus also of, of uh, skull cult. So I think uh, we're looking at a very, I don't know how, how equal everything was, um, but I think women were also as, just as influential as men. So were they inspired individuals larger than life leaders? Did they wield authority over their devotees, having them construct monumental buildings with limestone monoliths and statues in their likeness? Um, storytellers, hunters, and ritual adepts could have possessed a high level of what's termed charisma in the social, uh, sociological and anthropological literature. Uh, Charles Lindholm refer refers to charisma as the most important driver of religious transformation and certainly one of the most powerful emotional relationships possible in human life. Charisma, of course, has been the focus of studies um, by people like Max Weber, uh, Emil Durkheim, and Sigmund Freud. Um, it's the Weberian uh, theory of charisma that's uh, perhaps most influential among modern anthropologists. And he divided uh, political power into three types of action orientations, traditional, so an unthinking adherence to custom, legitimate, and charismatic. And he said that the charisma or the charismatic was the most potent and dangerous of the three action orientations. So, you know, are these charismatic individuals, um, inspired individuals, um, uh, were they the leaders that we're looking for? Uh, the flame ignited by a charismatic figure um, is likely to burn out following death, and the few cults that endure do so only if surviving devotees can turn the pure charisma of their leader into the secondary charisma of the institution. And that obviously didn't happen. I mean, we, can't, we can't see any institutions at the moment at Quebec or any, any other sites. The most common modes for transitioning from primary to secondary charisma are genealogy, blood offspring, appointment, um, and magical signs. Now, just broadly to look at the context um, of these, am I okay for time? I haven't looked, so okay. I don't need much longer. I'm yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to look at the context of uh, not only the, the, the touch templar sites, but also these inspired individuals or charismatic leaders. And um, so if you get back to basics, uh, I've shown these slides before, but I want to show them again, just to give you an impression of where we are um, uh, these are the radiocarbon dates from all the Neolithic sites. These ones haven't been updated yet. I have to add the ones from the touch tablet sites that haven't done so yet. What we can see here, um, uh, the spread from the Tigris region, uh, up Euphrates, Tibla sites, and, and in northern Iraq. Down here you can see the periods, and down here the climate details. But now, uh, it's much easier if we look at the map here to see how these sites developed and how the settlement developed in this part of the world um, at the different Phases in different phases. This is the younger Dryas, the yeah. Paleolithic, just before the PPM starts, okay. so before prior to the early Holocene. Um, we have a few sites along the Euphrates, we have a few along the Tigris. Uh, around the Orpah region, we have very little. In fact, Chakmok Tepesi could be the first dot here. Um, and of course, there are a couple of sites here a bit further away from um, uh, Orpah, uh, Surta Lassa, and uh, Istazala, um, where we have excavations from this early 1960s uh, from the frame of this uh, project by Bray, Wood and Chandler. Um, and there are plans, I think, that these will be looked at again at some point. Um, moving on, in the PPNA, things develop a bit further. Of course, we have an uh, increased number of sites along the river valleys. Um, of course, many of these sites become known through the dam building and the reservoirs. So it is a little bit sort of biased, perhaps. Uh, but in the plains, especially in the Haram plain, we don't know what's going on because there's so much alluvium um, that the sites are now in invisible, probably. Um, what happens after the PPNA, though, is quite interesting because we have uh, a lot of these sites disappearing, especially on the, the, the Tigris, but also along the, the Euphrates. A couple of sites, a few sites remain, um, uh, but they're also in decline. 
uh, through central sites, we'd say. But what happens in Gobekli Tepe or in the Shannon Water region, we have an explosion of sites. All of a sudden, people are there. Um, why? Where are they coming from? So this uh, leads me to this sort of conclusion that we're perhaps even seeing a movement of people into this region. But why are they moving? Obviously, something has changed. Is it climatic? I don't think so. We have no climate records for anything happening at that time. Um, but it could be, you know, changes in society. You know, these these hunter-gatherer communities they became settled. They're expanding. Demographic change. They're coping with quite new things going on in their lives. You know, they were used to be mobile. Or they used to have smaller groups. They could split up. They were quite independent. Now they were sort of stuck to one place. I mentioned in the in the beginning. You know, we have these challenges coming along. Um, uh, you know, how do you cope with growing populations? The territoriality increases. You have the first sort of has, haves and have nots. Um, so this is also something we need to consider these people were coping with at that time. And I think, um, you know, this could have, I don't know if it, led, it couldn't have led to, to this happening, but um, something happened that uh, we have a appearance of all of these sites in this region. Um, another interesting fact is, is that uh, domestic animals and plants don't occur at all sites. For example, in the Valley Choi in the early DPMD, we have domesticated animals and plants, whereby at Quebec we don't. So when this domestication happened, it wasn't like, you know, all washed over and it, every site had it. It seems to be down to personal decision, um, uh, individual decision or group decision. Um, but someone was deciding, you know, do we, even now at Quebec Tepe, after all of these years, and we know now that the the settlement went at least about 8,000 BC. We don't have any evidence for domesticated animals or plants, uh, even though I think you had a 400 years previous to that in the Valley Choi, there was. So why is that? Perhaps we're digging in the wrong place. Um, okay, this uh, period that I've termed the undergatherer crisis, perhaps we also see the first one of the pillars in this period. At least in the PPNA phase of the buildings at Gebeti Tepe, there's no real indication that we have T pillars from this, this phase. All the T pillars we have are in sort of later phases of the buildings. So perhaps that turned up at this time. Perhaps what we're seeing here is this: the, these groups or these inspired individuals, these charismatic leaders, trying to keep their groups together using mechanisms like these monumental buildings. Because if you look at uh, the layout, you see these two central pillars, you see these other pillars, all human depictions, uh, uh, sitting on a bench around. Um, it's obviously a meeting point. They're coming here to discuss. It's more than just ritual. Uh, the narratives are being told by the storyteller. They're being upkept by the traditions, by the read the passage and, and all of this. And I think they were key in keeping society together until it eventually did disband at the end of the PPN. Anyway, these are just some uh, sort of ideas that I'm having. I've spoken much too long, uh, so I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anita. This is a brilliant presentation. I'm sure that we are all suspect that we have questions on the table. Yes. Well, thank you very much. All the great, um, um, very inspiring um, talk. And um, actually, I would like to ask you about T-pillars. And I wonder whether T-pillar is actually a good category, a good uh, analytical category. Uh, so, because some, they look like pillars, but others, they don't have anthropomorphic representation of them. They look like they are anthropomorphic mm. or a bit alien-like. Yeah. Um, and uh, the way that they are placed in, in these buildings seems so suggesting that they are interspersed interspar between the benches. Yeah. Right? So, so people would have been sitting in between these uh, anthropomorphic representations. Oh, and I don't know, again, when I was there last summer for the first time, mm -hmm. I, I'm ashamed to say, but it looked... I, fe I felt like a bit like spirited away. I don't know whether you really watched Miyazaki's movie. But <laughs> the idea that these people would have been sitting together with ghosts, yeah, so with, with, with the representation of something that was no longer there. And of course, I mean, we cannot say yes or no, but why, why do, you, do you call them T-pillars? I mean, they, they seem to be something different. 
literally just because of their form, uh, the T shape. I mean, that was would, would be uh, what else would I call that? I mean, could call them statues, anthropomorphic. I, I mean, but I think I think this is something that came in with the, with the research history. They've always been called tipulas. Um, we would have been in, in Turkish, this the Kilitash. Um, uh, so, how, how would you interpret? I mean, not all of them are maybe, but some are actually anthropomorphic. Yeah, I mean, I think even though we don't have like the carvings of the hands and the arms and the and the loincloths and the belts and all of them, in fact, that only occurs on on the two central pillars in building D. The others, um, they sometimes some of the others do have arms. Some have what like what Klaus always called a stoa, which is like a you know priest would wear. But obviously, that's I don't like the terminology because obviously it's very you know it's, it's pointing in the wrong direction, like temple and stoa and altar and it's, you know, I wouldn't use any of that. Um, but that could be items of dress. I mean, uh, I think you know we we agree more or less in the project that the teepers are all human depictions or depictions of groups of people, um, and the narratives attached to them uh, or the depictions are then the narratives attached to those groups or to those individuals. Um, of course, the question is, you know, are we? And this is perhaps taking a bit further. Are we looking at deities? And I I, I think that we haven't reached that. That point yet. Um, I think we're still looking at ancestor veneration, mm -hmm. but then of course, you know, where is the where is the the the, the transition from ancestor veneration to um, uh, to gods and deities? Um, you know, the more we're seeing now from sites like Callahan, this two meter statue that they've got there, um, the more I'm beginning to wonder. I mean, that's also placed in a very central position in a special building. Um, but then we go into Quebec and find the wild boar is a focus. So. Um, I'm, I'm still a little bit sort of uh, undecided. I, I don't think we can decide even the, the human animal relationship that was going on. But humans were obviously, um, you know, I also don't like this argument that humans were separating themselves from the natural world. I find that a little bit sort of, you know, washed out at the moment. But um, the, the, the pillars, uh, okay, we call them tea pillars, but they, they are statues, if that's, yeah, yeah they're statues. That was a long way of answering that. Part of the round. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee, for this wonderful talk. It's always a pleasure uh, to listen to you and, and all these great discoveries and your ideas uh, about it. Uh, I was particularly happy to see uh, the pronunciation to hunter and hunting is a, is a very important endeavor, is also ritually loaded endeavor in, this, in these times. Um, uh, probably, uh, this is something I don't know. Uh, there will be a big publication coming out. I believe, there will be but, publications coming out. Actually, this this topic, in fact, yeah. I, I've actually been preparing as a paper, as a as a contribution. Yeah. To the um, I don't know. It, I believe that there are signs that many of these T-shaped pillar steels, or whatever we should call them, are reworked, which yeah. is, I think, a very important point that that there's one group coming in and then they're chiseling off the molars and mm. putting something else that might also testify to. Not only constant reuse, but but different groups yeah. with different backgrounds, different narratives, I displaying totally their stories. Yeah, totally. I mean, we do have evidence. I mean, some some of the depictions are hidden behind the walls. Obviously, they were used previously mm -hmm. in, in a different place, and then they've been moved, and some parts aren't visible. Other bits have been chiseled away. Um, so certainly, they were we were reusing things. Um, and of course, now knowing that the the, the buildings were so long lived, over centuries, in fact. You know how long does that pers persist? Uh, you know how often do they come in there and change um, these narratives? Um, so it gives a whole new perspective to to the development of these narratives over that sort of long, mm. long delay, as it were. And um, yeah, great. Uh, a brief comment I wanted to make, and probably I'm spoiling a good question now, which might come up, which is the dating of of Karahan Tepe and mm. this very early mm. peak, uh, three days. That I remember yeah. Stuart Campbell One day always story, telling us any number below 140 is fortune telling. Yeah, yeah. And three, the, no. Uh, I just include them because I wanted to show them. Yeah, yeah because that, that's yeah. what's available at the moment. Um, obviously, you need a statistically, yeah. much, much higher number. Of course, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, but of mm. course, it is perhaps suggesting that something was there in the Epipaleolithic. I don't know. I mean, somewhere this all, perhaps they're just natural, sort of, you know, blowing around. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's always a possibility. Um, but I'm not sure about the context of these data. I, yeah. I just got the data from Nejmi, who was kind enough to. Even, to even if there is a context. Three is mm. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm wondering also about Quebec because, of course, you know, this this uh, PPNA settlement area um, in the deep sounding. I mean, above that in the strata, there are PPNA dates already, and we're still we're still about a meter or two below that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're going beyond the, the early Holocene sort of border. I think we're still safely. Thank you very much again. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for your beautiful presentation. It was really informative. Uh, my question was about the burials that found recently. Uh, so when, when we look at the symbolism of these sites, not only this one, but every site in the Tash Tepeda project, we can see a heavily masculine community, interpretation of a community, and I was wondering where can you put these burials in this extent, female burials especially? Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, I thank you for the question. I mean, the the female, uh, I was surprised that we have so many, I think not surprised, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, uh, we have females at the site, I don't think they were banned. Um, but uh, I, I was happy, in fact, to see that we had the number of female burials that we do have. Obviously, this is just two two pits, yeah, two burial pits, it's no more than that. I'm aware, and we all know that the, the phallic symbolism at the site is, is very dominant, ubiquitous. Um, you know, if I didn't show it today, but we have also very large uh, phalli, you know, this, this, this size, uh, very heavy, um, uh, recovered from, from various pits. Um, uh, the, the, the phalli on the animals, on the, I mean, it is everywhere. And, you know, of course, we all know that the only female representation is this one from the Lion Pillar building with, on, the, on the slab that was taken from the bench. But literally, that's all we have. We don't have anything more than that. What I tend to sort of want to sort of you know remind you is that not all animals have ally, so they could also be the female animals. Um, but you know, um, where do I put? I mean, I, I do. I don't know. I mean, I can't help myself. But you know, because it's so many ally, I can't help but think of this. It's some sort of male-dominated society with hunters and. Uh, you know, it's probably literally incorrect to say that, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a male-dominated warrior, sort of, um, uh, say warrior, but hunter society. Um, but then again, you know, I mentioned these inspired individuals, and I really don't think that that's limited to the the, the males. I, I you know, we know from various ethnographic studies that women can hunt, and, you know, storytelling. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't give you better answer. That's a, Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, I just have another question about the T pillars. So you said there was a T statues rather than T pillars. So they're not used architecturally. They are. They are. Mm -hmm. So they're not al fresco. There was a roof. There was a roof. There was a roof. No, they're yeah. All yeah. Of them. Um, I think most of them. I, I, I certainly think that most of the T pillars had a roof supporting function. The two central pillars wouldn't have stood without a roof. Because they're in such shallow foundations in these these pedestals, in these pedestals, they would have fallen over. And uh, the uh, the teeplers in the in the walls, they're actually inserted into the walls, not stand. They were never freestanding. The walls were there first, and they were slotted in. And these teeplers in the in the walls, they're all they're all plus minus twenty, you know, plus minus 10, 15, 20 centimeters the same height, which would give them the perfect. So we're probably looking at some sort of sort of teepee sort of shape or cone shape. Roof, probably, but of course, everything's what we also tend to forget is that there's a lot of wood was probably used in these structures that's just rotted away. We were lucky to have these these um negatives that we found uh last year, but um, you know, that just proves that wood was available. We have lots of charcoal, obviously. We know that in the, in the environment, we have uh, probably oak, a scattered oak woodland, pistachio, that sort of thing. So they they did have wood supply, it was there. Um, and you know they would have steps in these buildings, probably sort of seating and, and various things. I mean, we, we just can't uh, you know forget or shouldn't forget um, that uh, we would have had a lot of perishable uh, items as well in these buildings. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have one question, and maybe after we shall continue outside of the team. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm one of these um, few, probably, uh, non-archaeology 
um, on these members. Um, if you may ask, just just some information. How big is that um, temple? Let's say, for the lack of the word of the room. Yeah, it's about uh, in the diameter of uh, 12, 13 meters. Ah, I see. Um, and also the um, non-religious buildings. If you can guess around, I mean, on oh, average, I mean, we're looking at three, four, three, four meters in length. The population. Four meters. Oh, the population. The support, yeah. How many people were living at the site? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, the problem is we've only got a, a very small part of the site excavated. Um, and even the northwest and southeastern parts of the site, site that was excavated, they're not joined in any way. So we, there's no way of actually showing whether they were in, inhabited at the very same time. Of course, the long duration might speak in favor of that. But of course, we know from other sites that they were perhaps hopping around different locations at different times of the settlement or occupation. Um, if the site, I mean, we have good evidence now from, from the main excavation area that a lot of the buildings are probably contemporaneous with the special buildings overlapping with the younger uh, rectangular trapezoid buildings uh, that share walls and various things uh, relate to one another. I mean, if we think that that was, you know, contemporaneous that we, and it expanded beyond that, I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at a, I mean, I hate to say the word, but perhaps even an early megasite, um, or the megasite's plus that word. We have them in Jordan, the PPMB, but um, wrong term, but at least a large settlement, a very flourishing settlement of PPMB with perhaps you know, a few hundred people, I might, might say. Yeah. Um, just one last thing, but um, if it's not an imposition, can you just do a quick compare contrast with Chateau Vuk? Chateau Vuk is a lot younger. Chateau Huyuk uh, appears, well, I think the earliest dates are from the late PPNB, so at a time when Gebekli had already fallen out of use. Um, it's in a quite different landscape, obviously, in the Konya Plain. Uh, so it's separated by a couple of thousand years. Um, and it's also separated by, I mean, a lot of the, the, the stuff at Gebekli, at Chateau is obviously late Neolithic, so seventh millennia. Um, and the great distance in between. Nevertheless, uh, there are similarities between the two sites. Uh, especially if you're looking at the symbolism, uh, the auroch, uh, the, the cattle, the wild cattle baiting. Um, you know, we actually have a, a very lovely um, uh, pillar, uh, pillar 66 in building H, which shows uh, a, a dying, dying auroch, actually with its legs bent and it's actually sort of tongue hanging out. And we have a very, very similar depiction on a wall painting from late Neolithic Chatar. Um, so there were obviously things had changed and some things had stayed um what we don't see at chata although we have the sort of central sort of special sort of cult buildings i don't know what ian calls them now um but what we don't have are the big monumental structures like a uh, it appears that a lot of the, the the sort of sort of you're going to disagree with me perhaps but a lot of the ritual stuff that's going on um at chata is actually more in a domestic sphere and not in the communal sphere and I think we even have evidence of that happening already at Gobekli because uh, the smaller domestic structures with the tea pillars, I'm just wondering if that's the first sort of instance of the communal moving away into the, to the, to the family groups and actually into the domestic. Um, and then eventually then the, the big monumental buildings being um, given up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if we don't have any question, and then after we, we should be the end. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, the T shapes, like in Lubin logograms. This kind of shape, if we look from the uh, like from higher, uh, it means God, like deity. Uh, so there is. Are there any relationships with that, like this kind of thing? I don't know quite what you're referring to, but um, I mean, for deities, I think we, we are, it's a bit too early. Um, as for any sort of uh, similarity, mean, I said we had similarities with like the late Neolithic in, in the Konya area, um, but I don't, it might go beyond that, but I think it's very hard to say. Um, uh, at least, uh, in this part of the world, you know, when these monumental buildings disappear, 
we don't have anything very sort of comparable until I don't know late Calcolithic Bronze Age that sort of time, and um, for that reason, I, I find it hard to to sort of. I don't think there was any sort of connection, uh, really between the the, the two. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I hope we'll continue uh, the session outside. Thank you very much.